Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the College of Engineering virtual brown bag series. Uh, as we wind down the uh, fall uh, semester, we have a distinguished speaker today. Uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker, I uh, just wanted to mention that uh, I'm going to be the host. I'm uh, Gautam Das, I'm the Associate Dean for Research uh, of the College of Engineering. And I've been hosting some of these faculty brown bag series for the last uh, couple of semesters, and I'll continue the tradition today. So, as you, some of you who have attended this would know that uh, uh, we have a presentation which will run for about 45 minutes, so thereabouts, maybe a little bit longer or less, depending on you know the speaker. And then, if you have questions, uh, please uh, feel free to. Uh, type them into the question box so that once the presentation is over, we like to give the presenter an uninterrupted, uh, you know, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And once the presentation is over, I'll be happy to read them out and uh, you'll get a chance to answer it. So, as I said, uh, we have a distinguished speaker today, our very own um, uh, National Academy uh, member of engineering and uh, presidential distinguished professor of electrical engineering department, uh, Jim Coleman, and he is going to be presenting uh, a very uh, a talk on a very succinct topic, quantum dots. So I'm also very anxious to know what exactly that is all about. Uh, James Coleman received his degrees in electrical engineering from UIUC. I think that's what they still call it in Illinois, Urbana. And after working in industry at Bell Labs and Rockwell International, he joined the faculty there at UIUC. And he and his students were the first group to define experimentally the range of wavelength, threshold current density, and reliability of 980 nanometer strain laser. And here I'm uh, expressing my own ignorance of the topic, uh, in gases laser. Uh, we will let uh, Jim explain a little bit more what that is. After 31 years, he retired from Illinois as the Intel Alumni Endowed Chair Emeritus. Since 2019, he has been at UTA as a Presidential Distinguished Professor of Photonics. Uh, Professor Coleman has published more than 600 journal publications and conference presentations, 13 book chapters, 10 US patents. He is a member of the US National Academy of Engineering, as I mentioned earlier. He's also a fellow of multiple professional societies, including IEEE, OSA, SPIE, APS, to name a few. Uh, he was awarded the 2021 IEEE Junishi Misi Java Medal for contributions to the development of strained laser, strained layer semiconductor lasers. Again, hopefully we'll hear more about that. His other awards include the John Tyndall Award of the IEEE Photonic Society and the Optical Society of America, the SPIE Technical Achievement Award, and the OSA Nick Holoniak Junior Award. With this uh, introduction, it's my pleasure to welcome our distinguished colleague uh, to this presentation, my pleasure to this presenter, Dr. James Coleman. Well, thank you, Gautam. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, indium gallium arsenide, but uh, not so much. I'll, I'll uh, have a few things to say about that. I tried uh, very hard to organize this talk in such a way that a wide range of, of backgrounds from undergraduates to graduate students to professors and all disciplines of engineering, I, I tried uh, to find a way to make uh, a broad introduction to quantum dots because you, you, many of you will have heard about quantum dots and nanotechnology and these uh, these buzzwords and not not appreciate what it is. And um, I uh, I want to try to hit a broad audience. So if if this is um, I, I, I'll try to avoid too much technical detail uh, in order to uh, uh, keep, you, keep you all awake and interested. So let me tell you about uh, quantum dots. The outline of my talk is going to be, why does anybody care about quantum dots? What's the point of that? 
And you may have seen lots of ads, especially at this time of the year when we're getting near uh, Black Friday uh, for quantum dot televisions. And that may be a little confusing. Should I have one of these? Um, well, actually I do, but you may or may not want. I'll, uh, I'll, but I'll tell you a little bit about why they're called quantum dot televisions and how they work. Then I'll talk a little bit uh, nearer to the end about semiconductor quantum dots, which is my my own research interest in and how we've been using them to make artificial quantum dot uh, crystals. And then my conclusion will be uh, very short and sweet. So why quantum dots? Let me uh, take you back to high school chemistry and remind you a little bit about uh, Neil Spohr, this handsome guy here, and uh, his model for, for the atom, which consists of a nucleus with uh, orbits at, at distances away from the nucleus, which correspond to a, an energy balance between the electrons, the negative charge on electrons, and the positive charge in the nucleus. And these, these orbits can be, as a carrier gets energy, it can change from one orbit to another. So we, we know that if we have an electron in one of these outer shells, an excited electron gets into one of these outer shells, it can drop back to the inner shell and in the process emit a bit of light called a photon and this this light photon is a packet of wave that has an energy corresponding to the the, the same energy that's the difference between the two uh, the two orbits photons are light and so it's interesting to compare what an atom looks like compared to what we know best, which is white light. And white light looks like the spectrum that you see here, and uh, it varies from the far infrared until the, the near ultraviolet and goes through the red, the green, and the blue. And uh, even if you didn't learn about uh, the origins of light, you probably learned that you can mix any of the three basic colors, R for red, G for green, blue, B for blue, the RGB colors to make any color you want. As you can see here, it's a continuum and it's hard to separate one color from another. And what's different about an atom is an example of neon, you can see each of these states are very, very sharp and very pure colored compared to the broad light that comes out from a white light source. Now, there's a lot of reasons to like white light, um, but there's also reasons to have very narrow line with light, such as these lines that you see in the neon spectrum. It's been practical use for, for many, uh, many decades, even, even more than 100 years. Uh, an example is mercury. We use mercury all the time as a light source. We use it in technical applications like making integrated circuits. And the lines that you see for neon, for mercury has the same kinds of lines, but you see they vary in amplitude and the spacing is, they, there are multiple lines and the spacing varies and they're actually not uh, very sh sharp compared to a neon atomic line because there's a lot of gas together and all that. But what about the other extreme? And so the other end of the spectrum uh, the, the physical and optical spectrum is semiconductors and uh, in particular silicon, which is a, the basis for the enormous uh, integrated circuit uh, chip business. So let me tell you a little bit about silicon. Silicon is in column four in the periodic chart. And if I make a plot here of energy versus atomic spacing, and I go out to the right where this is where the atoms are very far apart. Basically, the energy of a single silicon atom has all the shells that you knew about from the Bohr model, 
but we only look at the, the last two, the outer shell, which is the, the, the three level. And there's a 3S level that has two electrons in it. And there's a 3P level that has two electrons in it. But the silicon we use as a semiconductor is not out here at this far spacing. That would be a, a gas at this place. What we want to do is see what happens as we make put these atoms closer together and they eventually form bonds uh, to make up with the crystal that we use for silicon. So as you move inward, this is a, a, what Einstein called a Gedanken experiment. We don't actually know how to do this very well, but we, uh, you can think about it. So as we move uh, to the left, um, what was the sharp state as they start to come closer together, they impact each other. And you see this sharp outer uh, uh, orbits that Bohr talked about aren't so sharp anymore. They broaden because they're starting to share the electrons as these atoms move closer together. And if we go all the way to the far, far left in this at very close atomic spacing, we see that what was two um, discrete states in, in the atom have become very large bands down in this region. They all blend together and even come up and close and overlap in this region. Well, these are, are states because the atoms aren't all occupied, the outer shells aren't all occupied, but shared there's a, dense, a very high density of states in this region and this region. But not all of them are filled. Those, those are available states, but they're filled up to sort of the midpoint. And uh, that, that sort of depends on temperature, but um, basically the only thing that adding temperature does is make this region a little fuzzier instead of abrupt. Well, there's a natural place where silicon forms the diamond lattice structure, called the diamond lattice because it's the same as diamond. Um, they're one above each other in the uh, in the periodic table. And when when it reaches that stable point, it builds a very strong tetrahedral bond. So there are four bonds with each silicon atom four strong covalent bonds with nearest neighbors uh, to complete the outer shells of all of them by, by the shared electrons from the, the covalent bond. So that point actually takes place at a lattice constant of a little over uh, a half a nanometer. And what we see then is, is the semiconductor behavior that we use all the time, which is uh, filled states, so-called lower band, it's a valence band, it's completely filled, there's an energy gap, and then there's an upper band that's completely empty at zero Kelvin. When we, when we change the temperature to room temperature, we see a few carriers up here and, and, and open spaces down below. So that looks like this. If we look at the shape of the bands, we have a filled band below, an open band, an empty band above, and an injury gap in there. And if we apply some energy, basically we can take electrons, one or more, and move them up into the conduction band. Well, that's actually a great thing for us for many applications that you're familiar with, because if we use these once they're in this upper band and we move them around, that's how we make a transistor. And if we put them up there and let them collapse back and they emit light, that's how we make lasers and LEDs, semiconductor lasers and LEDs. So the question is, how can we um, uh, get somewhere that is some of the best of both of these worlds? Nice solid materials, but some of that atom-like behavior. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, semiconductor physics. So I'll keep this to uh, one slide and cover a third of a class in solid state um, semiconductor physics and hopefully do this in a sensible way. So th the one extreme is a bulk semiconductor like silicon or gallium arsenide. 
And there is a density of states in the um, in the conduction man. I said there were empty states, but I didn't say how they're defined. And that's sort of the shape as a function of energy. And we use a diagram like this. Now, this is a little backwards. Usually, if you have N of E, then E would be the horizontal axis and N would be the vertical axis. But just out of tradition, because we like to think of high energy and low energy, we draw it like this. So for a bulk semiconductor, the density of states starts zero. Well, zero energy is actually the lower edge of the, the conduction band, and, and there aren't any states in the gap. So as we go up in energy from that, we have this parabolic density of states. That just tells us where there are states, not whether they're occupied. So to find out if their states are actually occupied, we take the density of states and multiply it by the Fermi function, which is this blue line. And the product of these is the density of occupied states. Well, that's this purple region here. The outline of this is the density. And if we integrate that, we get the density of carriers, which is now the density of states the, times the probability that it's occupied over the whole case. Uh, a range of energy from uh, the conduction band to infinity. Why am I telling you this? Because this part here in corresponds to the current that we put into this. So this is the connection between the physics inside the device and what we control with a knob on the outside. So this in an LED basically is the device current. If I don't have any device current, I don't have any carriers in there, and the more current it put in there, the more I, I fill up and this region expands and grows and the peak gets higher. So that shape of this curve in something like an LED um, is ours also corresponds to the, the shape, the spectral profile of the light that comes out of it. And this compared to the neon lines that we saw a couple of slides ago is very, very broad. And that's okay for a lot of many of the things we want to do. It's not as broad as white light, but it's a significantly broader than the, the neon. So what we want to do is introduce the quantum dot. Now, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and, and shrink down this bulk material to a size where it's comparable to where we start to observe quantum mechanical effects. And suddenly the density of states function now, instead of being this parabola, becomes a set of discrete delta function states. And in reality, they're a little broader than that because we don't live at zero Kelvin. But otherwise it's the same. But if we design this right and multiply it by the Fermi function, we really only trap this one sharp state and the carriers will almost all be in that state. So if we go back to the LED that looked like this, we can make that emission come out as much more intense in a much narrower line. And now we got something that's starting to look like the lines we see in neon. Okay, so we can summarize what this quantum confinement means to say that the whole point of nanostructures is to use physical size, and I'll have a better example of that later, which really is energy confinement of small enough bits of material that they behave like semiconductors, but they approach some of the atomic-like behavior we'd like to see. And this is a picture of semiconductor quantum dots that we made in my laboratory a few years ago. And I'll tell you in a, in a later slide how exactly we did that. These are not the size of atoms, which are less than a nanometer. These are somewhere in the 30 to 50 nanometer region. So a quantum dot is a few hundreds or a few tens of thousands of atoms in a nanocrystal. It's too, too small to make a direct device out of it, but it's it has very atomic-like behavior. So the quantum mechanics called quantum confinement 
gives us a, a very precise wavelength and a much narrower optical line width than we get in an ordinary LED. So what started out in an LED as a broad line, this is, this is the optical, so this is wavelength along the bottom or color, is broad and, and lower level intensity becomes much narrower and much higher level intensity. Okay, so before I get into some of the more esoteric ways of we make semiconductor quantum dots and what we're working on in the futuristic sense, I want to give you a takeaway for uh, um, why there is a, an enormous commercial interest in one form of quantum dots, and that's the, uh, the quantum dot television. I'm going to back up a little bit and set the stage. So uh, the most successful, arguably the most successful uh, flat panel TV is uh, an LCD, a liquid crystal display television. Um, televisions, if you had a 75 inch television with a 75 inch screen uh, in the 1990s, it would have had it been 75 inches deep too, and it would have taken up your room and you would have to sit in another room and watch through the door if you wanted to see the television. Now, plasma televisions came about as a, and plasma displays actually was a great invention back uh, uh, earlier than that, um, and uh, even won an Emmy. But uh, they never were really bright enough to be practical. So the, the practical television that you have now is all based on the LCD or liquid crystal display television. And it works like this. You start out with a backlight. This is a source of white light and it may be uh, the sources of light themselves or a, a diffusive panel that you illuminate with white light in one way or another. You put a polarizer in there, it's not important what the details are on this, but it's part of the package with the liquid crystal. And the liquid crystal is this interesting material that if you add a voltage to the liquid crystal, it will change the polarization. And if you do that between a polari two polarizers, and you'll see in a minute there'll be another polarizer up here, it basically crosses the polarization in a way that's controllable by putting a voltage on it that works as a light valve. And so you can, you can electrically choose how much of the white light from your backlight gets through the liquid crystal and the two polarizers. Now we, just, we break that down into pixels and each of the and this this is integrated with a thin film transistor circuit that's built right in there, and you, so you take each of these pixels and you put its own voltage on it, and that changes the intensity. At this point, it's not it's not a colored light; it's just the the white light from your backlight, but you're controlling how much of it gets through. So before we put on the other polarizer, we put on what's called a Bayer filter. And the Bayer filter is um, um, a pattern that takes into account the fact that the human eye is very nonlinear. We see green much easier than we see blue and red. And so this particular pattern of filters uh, changes each pixel to be one of the three colors, the R, the G, and the B. And remember again, Crayons. You can take an R and a G and a B and mix them up and get any of the colors in between. So we put another polarizer on there and we take out the, uh, the light on pixels. And so the, the last thing is, is really just a protective clear screen. And that's what the front of your LCDV uh, looks like. The bare filter is made out of a polymer that's similar to that used for photoresist, if you're familiar with that from making integrated circuits, and it's dyed to be the particular color. So the color is, is, is not that pure, and it, some of the light is lost because of the nature of the color. Um, now, the first change between 
LCD televisions, when you're going to look in the Best Buy at televisions, you're going to see also LED televisions. Well, what's the difference? The answer is there's no difference. The only thing that is different at all is the source of the white light for the backlight. Originally, the backlights were made with compact fluorescent lighting and then just a, white, a clear or a white diffuser panel here to, to make the light as uniform as possible. More recently, the industry has moved to using white light LEDs, which are much more efficient. And there's an energy and is also an ecology issue for getting rid of compact fluorescent lighting because of the hazardous materials, mercury and things like that that are in them. We need to stop using that stuff. So um, LEDs were first added along the edges and then now there are edge LED panels, broad area panels that can be made and they're manufactured all the time. And, if your house is only a couple of years old, you may not have any other lights in it than uh, LED lights. So the liquid crystal, the LCD television is the original design. The LED television is just an LCD television with a white LED. Interestingly, the way the white LED is made is really very similar to a compact fluorescent. Um, except that the light, the exciting source is a blue or ultraviolet LED. And then the white light comes from a phosphor, <clears throat> which is the same thing that's inside a compact fluorescent lighting. And uh, so the LED part of an LED television is only a change in the backlight. But let's talk about the quantum dot television because things get really different here. Um, so the quantum dot television is an LCD TV, but the backlight, instead of being white LEDs with a phosphor in it, is made of blue LEDs, and they're much, much sharper, narrower in color than the white light. What's really different is the bare filter is completely different. The bare filter is a film containing quantum dots for red and for green. But we, it's just a clear filter for the blue pixels because we're already using a blue LED. So it's a blue background light going through the, the quantum dots that filter out everything but the red and the green. And here's an example of what those quantum dots look like. Now, these are in a liquid suspension. This is cadmium selenide, and there are, that, that's one of the commercial ones, but there are some other ones involving indium compounds and so on, in liquid suspension. And then there's an ultraviolet light that is, is used to illuminate those. And so when you shine the ultraviolet light, you can get different colors but the only thing that changes, the cadmium selenide is a small nanocrystal. And if you choose the right sizes, you get the right colors. So if the average diameter is 4.2 nanometers, you get a very clear, bright red color, orange, green, blue. I skipped the ultraviolet, which is sort of too far in the purple. These three colors then, the red, green, and blue, can be used to make the other colors that you want. Um, so we take this filter with, with openings in it, and we take the conventional spectrum from those, from that filter, and by using quantum dots, make the intensity much sharp, higher, and the uh, line width much sharper. This is a chromaticity curve, but I can't hope to explain to you what it is in, in under uh, a few minutes. So trust me on this, but basically this shows if the corners are red, blue, and green, this is what the eye sees as you vary between them. Now the odd shape of this curve and the, the fact that everything looks so green or red comes about because your eye is not linear. So what we do is they, they make the curve adjust for the nonlinearity in your eye so that this is how much you mix. If you go along this line, if you take blue up to this point where it looks like it's about 
then you're right at that. What your eye sees is the halfway point between red and blue, and that's that nice uh, violet color. A conventional RGB uh, LCD TV looks like this. The R and the, the G and the B are not in the corners. They're at the corners of a triangle that looks like this. And it tells us what we can do and what we can't do. So the first thing is a color purity. And the farther a color is from white, where they all meet together to give you a pure white, the farther you are from that, the, the, uh, the purer the color is. So with the filters we have in a conventional LCD, they're not really pure. We'd like to be out here. For blue, we'd like to be further out here. And green, we'd like to be way out there. But the color purity is, is the distance of, from the white points. The color gamut, which means the range of colors that are available to us, depend on the area of the triangle, and we'd like that to be as big as possible to match what your eye sees. The color depth is the number of bits per color, and that requires to, to get more colors that you can distinguish, you need to have narrower lines. So one of the big things about the, the quantum dot is these narrower lines allow us to have more colors between the two endpoints. And saturation, which relates to the brightness of any one color, all of these things in the quantum dot are great, um, vastly improved. So a quantum dot triangle looks like this, where the corners are pushed out in all directions, especially in the green. So we've increased the color purity for all three sources. We've increased the area in the triangle uh, so a, a larger color gamut. The number of bits per color, because the light is narrower, we get more bits per color. And the saturation is because they're brighter. They're, the light that you, 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 available light can be much brighter for the same amount of current. So the colors in a quantum dot television are much sharper and much brighter. The whites and blacks are much deeper because we have control over uh, the polarization in a, in a better way and the whites are made up of smaller colors. The, the pure colors don't have extra in them. Uh, it's unbeaten for saturation. And turns out in order to get the, uh, the color depth for 4K video, uh, which now you can get and um, uh, ultimately 8K, which is coming, you, you just can't do it with the conventional LED or LCD TV. You got to have the quantum dots or something similar that has the same effect. So I hope that gives you a takeaway about the practicality of this and you don't have to go around uh, Amazon or Best Buy very far to see how many how many televisions are available and being sold all the time. So it's an enormous commercial marketplace. I don't know what the value is, but it, uh, it must be staggering. I wanna shift gears a little bit and tell you about how we make the quantum dots that I use and some, some future possibilities for this. So to make quantum dots, there are several ways to do it for a semiconductor. One of them is to use strain. Gautam mentioned strain and my interest in strain going back a long time. Strain semiconductors, um, uh, we, we were able to find that if you take a semiconductor with two, two semiconductors with different lattices, if the layer on of the larger lattice, for example, is larger, the fact that they're grown together will cause it to strain. And if it strains too much, it becomes useless. But if, if you strain it a little bit, it turns out it changes the physics in a way that can turn out to be reliable, even though your expectation is any strain system is eventually going to fail. It's not necessarily true. But we use strain above the level that's accommodated to force the growth of quantum dots. And it does it like this. We basically, when we start growing the first atomic layer, the first, 
The blue material you see is a larger lattice and it's growing on a substrate that's smaller lattice. The very first few atomic layers just grow in a layer by layer. You know, they spread out and spill and even out. And then when the next layer comes on, it starts to do something different. As the strain accumulates, it causes it to grow in three dimensions instead of two. So what started out as a layer by layer, and that's how unstrained materials grow, becomes sort of collective. It, it, the energy changes such that it's more likely to grow up than to grow out. So what started out as a thin, thin single layer is uh, becomes a very thin layer with these larger sort of pyramidal looking uh, quantum dots on it. And here's a, a, an image of quantum dots done by our EE department head, Diana Huff Huffaker in her earlier life. And what you can see is these dots are clearly, clearly different. Um, there's, a, there's some variation in the size but it's easy enough to see that these things are um, in the 30, 40, 50 nanometer diameter. And they're sort of randomly distributed in that. We had interest in avoiding uh, the, the random variations in size. So we started making quantum dots by pattern growth or etching. And this is using silicon processing technology put down an oxide of semiconductor and pattern some holes in it and then grow the material in there. What we found is you, there's some irregularity just because there's limits to how, how accurately, how precisely you can do the patterning. But when you take away the oxide, etch it away, it leaves behind some variation in size, but absolutely no variation in distribution because it's the patterning is so clear. And there's a picture of uh, one of one of ours from uh, from 2004, and those are what the dots look like after you've etched away the the oxide. And in fact, you can combine these two techniques and do both the strain driven and pattern. And we've done that. We basically put some holes in the oxide first, and then grew the material in the holes using the same process in uh, self-assembly. They, they're still self-assembled, but the diameter is sort of constrained by the size of the hole, and then the patterning comes is very regular. So the quantum dot we thought first about was what happens when you make a quantum dot and it's in a it's in a background field with the, with nothing. What if you could go the other way and and introduce a, a resonance scattering structure? Now, you you generally even if you don't know it, you're generally familiar to resonance scattering structures because crystals are all resonance scattering structures. Uh, they scatter the carriers and uh, they do this on a scale that's, that's less than a nanometer. So it's uh, very much in the atomic regime. Uh, people have been doing photonic crystals, which is done in the optical regime. And now it's not affecting the carriers, but it's affecting any light that's in there. And if you put a pattern in there uh, that's hundreds of nanometers or roughly what the wavelength of light is, um, you can you can route structures and affect light, and uh, some of these things are turning up in uh, um, sensors and stuff like that. We wondered if you could go in between and do something in the electronic regime. And so here's a, a strained layer. Um, and let me tell you what this is and see if I can convince you. So the first, the gray material is... Um, is gallium arsenide, and for the moment, just remember that that's higher energy material. Um, the purple looking material is indium gallium arsenide. It's an alloy, so it's 25% indium arsenide mixed with 75% gallium arsenide. And because of the indium, this has a lower uh, energy. Now we take this material, we grow this first 
take a gallium arsenide, grow this first layer, stop and put some holes in it, and then grow some material on top of it. So basically this layer is a Swiss cheese or perforated sand layer at lower energy, completely surrounded top, bottom, and, and through the pores with higher confining energy material. The thickness of this layer is typically anywhere from fifth, five to eight nanometers. And the physical size is again, 30, 40, 50 nanometers limited by the patterning. So this is a periodically perturbed quantum well active layer in the electronic regime, which is of the order of tens of nanometers. This introduces localized 3D confinement. And, and the way to view that is to say that the carriers will live in the solid purple material, but they'll stay most localized in the regions that are farthest from the high energy material above or in the pores. So if you were to calculate the carrier density in there, it would look uh, graphically, it would look something like this, where red is the highest uh, density of carriers and blue is a lower density of carriers, but not zero. And that's, that's the key to where this is going. So you have the ability to engineer with your pattern how you want this to look. So we can make a sparse pattern where there's little holes and widely separated. We can do localized where we have medium sized holes and media sized separation, or it can make what looks like a quantum dot by having very large holes close together so that basically these areas will pinch off and produce a sort of a squished triangular shape dot of material. So this allows you to shift with your pattern and change the amount of quantum-like uh, confinement that goes on. And we can do anything you want. You can make hexagonal lattices or square lattices, or you can use any other pattern you want. You can put defects in there, whatever. Um, in fact, it's such a large space that uh, it, it requires some analytical work before you go in the lab or you'll go broke trying to guess what to make. Now let's look at those uh, 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 calculated not ca cartoon version of the carrier density. So deepest red is where there's the most electrons and blue means essentially no electrons. And these are the three cases again, the sparse, localized, and the quantum dot. You can see the carriers are isolated in the quantum dot. And these are isolated from each other, but um, not so isolated, and then this sample basically is only slightly perturbed. So what we realized is that if we take this quantum dot lattice and form a hexagon, and then look at the analysis around hexagon, this looks like a benzene ring. And the, the corners of the benzene ring um, are where the carriers are most concentrated. It's sort of, by analogy, looks like this, which is a one-dimensional uh, crystal, uh, a planar single, uh, single atomic layer crystal. And if you don't recognize, this is graphene. And graphene separately is a, is a source of a lot of interesting research and in commercial applications. So we think there's a, there is a very good analogy between this and some opportunities to explore, and there's much more to do before we can say that conclusively, but it should be possible, in fact, directly possible to make stacked layers of these that wouldn't be floating in air, they would be embedded in a high energy material like gallium arsenide, and maybe with some more clever uh, processing, get to the point where we could even make a, a full three-dimensional crystal of nanostructures, not atoms. So this is, this is um, where we're going and where we've been nanotechnology. Richard Feynman says there's plenty of room at the bottom and uh, 
and predicted some of this interest in nanostructures more than 60 years ago. Um, we've got a lot to do, and I hope you learned a little bit about quantum dots and maybe how to pick your next television. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Coleman. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, lecture on some of the very interesting things that you and your team are doing here. So at this point, I would uh, urge the audience to type in the questions. I'm sure you have a few uh, into the into the question answer chat box, and it'll it'll uh, I will read them out uh, to Dr. Coleman, who can answer them. I have a. Actually, I have a whole bunch of questions myself, uh, and again, these are probably very naive questions, uh, so I will seek your indulgence in trying and answering them. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, when you talked about LCD and LED, I've been hearing these phrases for 30, 40 years, perhaps. I think uh, I remember when I was a student in the in a undergraduate student in the late 70s we were getting our first lcd calculators you know, mm -hmm. those little flat calculators so uh, is the difference between led and lcd is mainly the the backlighting and everything else is sort of the same the 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 lcds are essentially unchanged the, the lcd in an lcd tv and the lcd in an led TV and the LCD in a quantum dot television is all the same. It's just a light valve. It's not does it's independent of color and it's not even the same material. So it has nothing to do with the quantum dots. It's entirely in the backlighting for the LED and it's in the bare filter for the quantum dot. I see. Okay. Uh, I will continue with my own questions, but there is another one uh, from the audience. Uh, so, can you see this being used to make 3D dynamic memories? That's the question. Um, 3D, actually not just memory, but 3D electronics is a holy grail. Um, where uh, Moore's law has taken us down to the point where the planar technology um, is is going to run out of space. It just, you know, the whether whatever you believe the limit, the limit is already getting. We're already getting there when we're down to the size of c single atoms. So the next the next major step, however, it's done is to use the Take, take the electronics of density in an integrated circuit and make it three dimensional. Um, and, and that would raise the density to the to the three halves power. So that's that's a gain. The truth is though that planar technology isn't so planar anymore. As we learn how to make transistors smaller and smaller, we need more wires and to do that, we a typical integrated circuit now has one layer with transistors in it and anywhere from seven to 13 layers with wiring in it to, to interface with them. So the, the question is a, a very important one and a very open one at the moment. Could, uh, could we do that? I, um, I can imagine in a very uh, naive, also naive way, that sure, if you if, if you can use uh, if you can use uh, the what looks like an artificial bond in our structure as a wire, yeah, I could see see doing that. But I don't know how to do the three dimension version yet of my own stuff. So that has to wait. Uh, wait. But three D electronics is is on everybody's radar screen. But no one has come up with a a show stealer that tells how it should be done. OK. Uh, next question. Uh, I'm a software engineering major and was wondering how software engineers or computer science majors contribute to the subject. The, uh, I mentioned in passing um, that the, the design space for um, um, 
making the the crystals, the the one dimensional crystals we we're making, is so large that we can't. And the expensive uh, the the experiments are very complex and expensive. We can't. We just can't afford to do all the possible experiments that are are um, unguided. So as in many disciplines, computer science uh, and the ability to do uh, sophisticated, fast computational analysis of the, the down to the near atomic level of, of quantum mechanics and, and solid state physics, it, it, we have to be, we need the, the guidance to make smart experiments. So there uh, are, in my discipline, every, every year since I started, um, we include more and more analytical work and that's inevitable, inevitably done by uh, computer uh, science. So someone who has an interest in that kind of work, uh, modeling and simulation, uh, first of all, every, every physics student, or electrical engineering student these days needs to have good analytical skills. But if you're actually can live in both those domains, you'll, you'll have an invaluable skill set. Uh, so just to follow up a little bit, uh, is there a, I mean, I, I know that uh, material science has a lot of use for uh, computer simulations in predicting, you know, uh, how materials will behave without actually having to do them in the labs. So I think what I'm hearing is that uh, even in photonics, when you're trying to construct this new uh, materials and structures, you will be able to use a lot of, uh, you know, computers to maybe predict how these things are going to behave without having to fabricate them in the labs. Is that uh, really the message? That is that is exactly correct. And, uh, uh, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the things that attracted me a long time ago as a graduate student to this field was that it included optics, it included materials, included electronics. Well, the, the simulation tools have to do all of those right. And they're all complicated enough in their own right. So it, it, is, a, it is a very complex analytical problem. And how accurate is it? I mean, are they, whatever they predict or they simulate, uh, is it uh, off by orders of magnitude or are they usually right on the money? You know, it's interesting. It, just as nanoscale is trying to hit the middle space between bulk things that are large and atomic things that are small, that's sort of also the same sort of uh, fuzzy boundary because people can do very sophisticated analysis at the atomic level or near atomic level. Mm -hmm. And, but then we really have a lot more atoms than that. Right. So they are, the, at the intersection in between uh, quantum mechanics and conventional optics and, and, and materials things, that's where, that's where the complexity lies. Um, and so making the interface, the impedance match between those two regimes of very small and, and very bulk like is where the, where the fun is. Interesting. Yeah, because uh, I used to hear about molecular dynamics uh, as a sort of area where a lot of computer simulations were used to predict the dynamics of molecular structures. But I think what you're saying is that at the nano level, uh, things become maybe more complicated because uh, the scale is a little bit bigger, perhaps. Maybe that, that's what I'm understanding. Exactly. All right. Uh, so uh, coming back to commercialization, um, who is at the top of the game right now? I mean, are there, are there some TV companies which are almost at the verge of producing this quantum dot? Televisions, or we are still some ways away. Well, uh, it it um, yes is is probably the right answer to that, uh, or the most visible answer, because uh, the nature of the com commercial uh, the companies that are doing these kinds of things can vary. 
Um, you know, for example, Intel uh, makes integrated circuits and they'll be aware of these kinds of things and interested as they project several generations out. And so is Samsung, but of course, Samsung also works on electronic devices and on television. So, you know, there's sort of an in-house versus the, uh, collaborative kinds of approaches. And in commercial environment, there's an economic aspect of that that uh, is, is beyond my uh, uh, job description. Um, so uh, the, there, there are examples of all of that. But, uh, and then there are, uh, you know, there are other uh, mass market um, companies that have a very small uh, product who purchase a lot of the technologies that they need from some of the big ones. So Samsung, uh, you know, I don't know their business plans either, but uh, uh, they make more, uh, more chips and things than they use for their own products. So there, somebody is buying those and putting them into something else. Once you take the cover off, you can't always tell where the parts came from. Right, right. So uh, one more question from the audience. Uh, this is from Stanley. Do you by any chance have a website that you have more information about this topic? I'm sure you do, uh, if you could uh, elaborate on that. Well, you know, that's not, we, we probably should have a, a um, uh, I don't have an individual website. We are, we are just in the process of building a website for the Photonics Center in, uh, at UTA. And uh, that, at our level of research, we, we spend more time doing this in the conventional uh, literature, uh, conference presentations, and, and technical papers. Um, so we don't tend to write uh, web pages at a um, at a at a different level. So, um, but it it would be a it would be a good idea to do such a thing. In fact, uh, would you be able to share uh, any any sort of articles? on this uh, topic, uh, maybe survey articles for maybe mass consumption or anything that will be really useful. Uh, not just your research, but uh, the general area. Yeah, I could take a look. There are some, there are some sources I've used for this and there are, uh, um, anybody who wants to talk about this, you know, I'm, I'm like every other professor. I like talking about my stuff. So if any, anybody who has any further interest in this, get in touch with me. You can find my email easily enough and uh, um, we'll talk. And I, I, if I know what your interest, where your interest is, um, I can find some things for you, including some review papers and things that we've done. So that's easy enough to do. I'm always happy to, to if somebody's interested, just get in touch. Great. Well, Dr. Coleman, I think we're approaching one o'clock and uh, it's time to wrap up this uh, you know, fascinating conversation. Uh, thank you so much for giving us a glimpse of the kind of research you do. We're looking forward to you know, seeing some of this uh, getting commercialized so that all of us can get the next Quantum Dot TV, you know, maybe in our mm -hmm. lifetimes. <laughs> okay. uh, with that, uh, I would like to bring this uh, presentation to a close and uh, I think, uh, Tracy, if I'm not mistaken, we probably still have one more uh, for this semester. So uh, look right. forward to yeah. having. Yeah, we do. So, one more next Friday. Right. So look forward to seeing some of you back there. And uh, again, thanks, Dr. Goldman, for this wonderful lecture. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye bye.